Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Hey, uh, welcome this morning. I'm Joel. I'm the teaching pastor, and it is so good to be with you guys for our new series called Run to the Battle. And before I get started, I got to say something. Uh, This week, I was out speaking. I spoke a series of events. I did one in Atlanta, and then I did one in northern Alabama as a men's event. And I just want to say how grateful I am for our pastors, Marcus and Natalie, for allowing me to do what I do. I literally could not be doing what I do without them. Uh, A a few years ago, the Lord told me, gave me a mission to do, and I was like, I don't know how I can do that. And he's like, I'm going to send people to, that, are, that believe in you. And man, Pastor Marcus and Natalie do that. And a lot of guys, they come up to me and they're a lot of pastors and like, man, how could I get the arrangement you have with Marcus? And I'm like, honestly, bro, I don't think you're humble enough or secure enough in yourself to have the arrangement <laughs> Marcus has. I don't know any other pastor that's willing to give some other dude 24, 30 Sundays up on the stage here. Most pastors are like, I got to be in there 50, 50 Sundays of the year and then they burn out. But anyway, I am so grateful for them, and I just want to say thank you for allowing me to do this. Um, it's, so, it's just so cool to, to, first of all, it's cool to be able to get to go out and, and speak at different churches around, but then to always come back home with you guys. So, yeah. All right. We love you, Joel. Run to the battle. So here, here's the thing. You're in a battle whether you know it or not. Now, for some of you, it's very clear. But, but, but the problem is the battle you think you're fighting isn't the, really the battle you're fighting. Some, some of you think you're fighting a battle against a person, but all battles have, first of all, a spiritual element to them. So this isn't a series on spiritual warfare, but I just want to let you know that, that oftentimes what we think we're fighting against is not what we're actually fighting against. But, but the reality is if you don't recognize that there's a battle going on for your soul, that there's a battle going on around you, then you just become a victim. But if you wake up and say, okay, there's a battle here and I need to do something about it, I need to get engaged, then you have a lot greater chance of survival. In fact, the Bible says if you'll get engaged, you actually have a 100% chance of victory. Not because of you, but because you're on the winning side. So the key is make sure you get on the winning side. So we're going to be talking over the next four weeks about the life of David and some of the battles he had to fight in order to achieve the destiny God had for him. And every one of us has the exact same battles in our life that we're going to have to fight to become, to pursue all that God has for us. So I want to start with a story. Um, Right after Emily and I had been married, we'd been married about a year we felt called to move to Peru in South America and work with a couple that was starting a cafe and a church. I was going to run the church, uh, and they were going to run the cafe. Well, we got down there, and like the first weekend, he's like, hey, I got a bunch of people together. We're going to start the church. I'm like, that's great. Let's do it. So we started this church, and the church started to take off. We had people from all over the world. At one point, we had like 20 different countries represented in our church, people from all over the world. And, uh, but our cafe, it just couldn't go. And I am, I say this as humbly as possible, but I'm really good at getting stuff started, okay? <laughs> Keeping it going, that's a whole other issue. <laughs> but I have this, I don't know if it's just stupid optimism or what it is, but I can get stuff going. Like, I get in over my head all the time because I'm just like, yeah, we can get through that wall. And I just start kicking and punching and I get all bloody. And then we're like, hey, we got through the wall, right? So I was like, oh, man, this is cool. I'm going to be able to bring some of my skills to, to help this guy get this cafe started. And I told him, I was like, man, I'm, I'm pretty good at starting stuff. And he's like, okay, okay, well, I'm going to start this cafe and blah, blah, blah. And so we get into it, and like, we'd show up at staff meetings, and he'd ask me to do things like figure out where we can find, buy Snapple for the cafe in South America. I'm like, dude, why are you asking me if I can find, like, anybody can find Snapple. Let me help you with some of the red tape getting this thing started. I'm, I'm I speak, I'm fluent in Spanish. I like fighting government officials. Like, I can get this thing started. But he never would ask me to help him. And I'm like, what's going on here? And so finally, after months and months and months, he just got frustrated. 
and he threw up his hands and he came in one day and he's like, this is impossible. We're never going to be able to get this cafe started. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? Somebody had just donated us $15,000, but he felt like that wasn't enough. And I'm like, I could start a cafe in the U.S. on $15,000. And he threw up his hands. He said, I'm moving back to the U.S. Yeah, the problem's just too big. And I was like, ah, what? And as he was leaving, I said, man, do you, do you mind if I get the cafe started? He's like, you'll never be able to get it started, but go ahead. And four weeks later, our doors opened. Now, that's not to brag on me, right? But here's what I want to talk about. Every one of us in our lives, we've got something in front of us right now that as you look at it, you say something like my friend said about that cafe. The problem's just too big. I've been trying to get this financial situation solved, but it's just too big. I cannot get it beat. I can't, we can't conquer this thing. Some of you, your marriage, you have been trying and trying and trying to get over the hump in your marriage, and it's just not happening. You're like, this is just too big. Some of you have been fighting with your kids over something, a battle with your kids, and you go, man, it's just their addiction. I just don't know if they're ever going to be set free from it. It's just too big of a problem. It's too big of a battle. Some of you in your job, you're facing some challenges right now that you're saying, man, the problems in this company are just too big. I don't know if I can, I can survive this. Some of you in your business that you own, you're looking at it, you're going, it's just, I, there's no way I can do this. We've all got a situation in front of us where we go, the problem is just too big. And here's my main point this morning. If you walk away with nothing else other than this, my point is this. God has given you everything you need right now to fight the battle in front of you. You have what it takes. And you say, well, I'm not so sure about that because I've been trying. Well, my goal over the next few minutes is to prove to you that God has already given you everything it takes to fight the battle in front of you. And to do that, we're going to look at a story that every one of us know. Even if you didn't grow up in church, you've heard of this story. It's the story of David and Goliath. Yeah. But I'm going to come at it from a bit different of an angle than you've probably ever heard it, it shared. David, we know the story of David. He's told at an early age he's going to become the king of Israel. But then he gets sent back to the shepherd field. It's like I would have thought if some guy came and anointed me as the next president of the United States, I'd be like, well, where's Air Force One? He's like, no. <laughs> Go back and keep watching the sheep. So David goes back and watches the sheep. And then this moment arises where his father sends him to the battle lines where his brothers are. And he's on his way to the battle line. He goes to the battle lines and he hears this giant Goliath coming out, standing out and mocking the people of Israel. He's like, come on, send your greatest warrior out to me. But all the men in Israel are terrified of this giant because the problem's just too big. Including the king himself. It says Saul was the tallest of all the people in his uh, that's part of the reason he got chosen. He was the tallest of all the people in Israel, but he didn't even go out and fight Goliath because this is literally such a big problem that nobody wants to do. Everyone was frozen with fear. And then little David comes along. Cocky little David. And he's like, what? why are y'all letting this guy talk trash about God? And they're like, David. And his brothers get mad at him. They're like, who do you think you are, man? Who do you think you are? You think you got some skills none of us hardened warriors have? Well, the word gets back to Saul. And Saul's like, who's this punk kid thinking he can take on this giant? So he calls David in. <laughs> David starts talking. Here's what David says. David said to Saul, hey, don't let anybody lose heart. Don't let anybody be afraid of because of this giant Philistine. Your servant, I'll go fight him. <laughs> you ever met somebody that's just totally naive? You're like, oh, they're about to get it handed to him. Saul replied, hey, buddy, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. And he's big. He's like really big. But David said to Saul, no, hold up. Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. And I paused it there because that's kind of funny. <laughs> you know, they say it's better to be a, a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. Don't worry, I can fight this guy. I've been watching out for sheep. <laughs> when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. 
We talked a couple weeks ago, Pastor Marcus talked about Benaiah diving into a pit with a lion while it was snowing and slippery. Like, who does that? Here's another guy that does it. And interestingly enough, a few years later, David picked Benaiah to be head of his guard because he's like, oh, I like guys like that that chase after lions. I went after it. I struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. And when it turned on me, which lions tend to do when you're trying to take what they want, I seized it by its hair. I struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both a lion and a bear. This uncircumcised Philistine, that's just trash talking right there. will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. Now, here's my first point. God has already prepared you with what you need to fight the battle in front of you. He's prepared you through your natural ability, and he's prepared you through past experience. Emily, my wonderful wife, is one of the most hospitable, loving people you'll ever meet. When people meet her, like seconds after meeting her, they walk up to me and say, your wife is probably the sweetest person I've ever met. And I go, yes, it's true. Now, what's interesting about this is my wife doesn't see that about herself. Because it's so natural to her, she thinks everybody's that way. And, and every one of you have a gift like that, too. There's something that's so natural to you, it just, ha- like, naturally, you just, like, you see numbers this way, or you see things that way, or you can size up a situation. It's so natural to you that you think everybody's got it, but they don't. Take me, for example. My, all the guys that stood with me in my wedding, you know how you have that moment, like, the night before the wedding where everybody gets up and says something nice about the the person that's getting married, all the guys that stood in my wedding, every one of them like got up and said something like this, man, when I first met Joel, I hated that guy. (laughs) We got into so many fights. He's such a punk. But man, I love him now. All of my best friends, they didn't feel warm, fuzzy, sweet feelings when they first met me. Now, I could try to be like Emily, and I need to learn some of that, but I'll never be as loving and welcoming as she is naturally. And you've got something that's the same to you. And the thing is, a lot of times, because we don't have a power gift, like, well, I can't stand up and talk to people, or I don't have that, you think you've got something that's insignificant, but it's not. It's really important. And if you're not using that because you feel it's insignificant, the world is missing out on something very important. And you've got a gift through your natural ability that you don't even realize you've got because you think everybody's got it because it's so natural to you. You just ooze it out of you. It's like an energy you project on the world. (laughs) Apparently, my energy is confrontation. (laughs) Interestingly enough, last week's message, I have never, ever in my life gotten as much feedback about a message as I did last week's message. And you know what it was about? Confrontation. I got up and talked about what I'm really familiar with. And to me, it was like, well, duh, of course you would do this, because I live to confront. But for a lot of people, they're like, I don't live to confront. I'm not, I don't have issues like you, right? <laughs> but the thing that's frustrating about myself sometimes is also my gift to the world, and the same thing will be true to you. The thing that you probably are like, man, I wish I was a little more like that. Well, maybe the, the way you are is what you need to lean into and get better at it. Because God put that in you. And, you know, it says in Ephesians 2.8, it says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which the Father prepared way in advance that you should walk in them. You're here in this space and time in history with the gifts he's given you, even the ones you don't like very much, for a reason. And we need that. So don't belittle what God has put in you. That's a dangerous place to be in when you belittle what God has put in you. So what you do is you lean into it. You also have some past experiences that have prepared you. You know, a person with experience is never at the mercy of a person with a theory. And you've got some experience to share with the world of God's goodness, his redemption in your life. And you can walk confidently. And listen, this is what humility is. Humility is just having an accurate picture of yourself. It's recognizing, I am really good at this. And I'm going to use it for God's glory. And I'm really not good at that over there. Humility is an accurate picture of who you are and who you aren't. 
And David, though it sounded like bragging, I'll take that boy out. Hey, it ain't bragging if you can back it up. That's right. Amen. So you're already prepared. So here's the story that goes on with David. The Lord rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, and he'll also rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. I'm not afraid. I know, I've, 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 I know what I am and I know what I'm not, and I can do this one. Saul said to David, okay, go and the Lord be with you. So then Saul had a great idea. If you're going to fight a Philistine, you need armor that fits what you're trying to do. So Saul dressed David in his own tunic, and he put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. Then David fastened on the sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he wasn't used to them. And then he goes, I can't go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. Another version of this, which I love, but I, it was another translation I chose to not use. It says, these are not tested with me. And he said, I'm not used to them. I these aren't tested with me. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, the one he used to watch sheep. He chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. You're never going to win your battle trying to be something you aren't. A lot of times we compare ourselves to what something that somebody else has, and we go, if I just had that, I could do it. And, you, and, and what you're really doing is belittling the gift God put in you. Because remember, he prepared you beforehand to walk in the works that he has for you. He knew exactly what you'd need to fight the battle that you've got to fight. So don't belittle what he put, gave in you. And a lot of times people will say, well, you'll need this to do that. I'll never forget when I first started leading outdoor adventures. I would get emails from people, and they would write, and they would say, who qualified you or certified you to lead outdoor adventures? And I'd be like, uh, God? I didn't have any certifications, didn't have any outdoor wilderness survival skills. And I felt super intimidated about it. I was like, man, I, you know, I've led some outdoor adventures and stuff, but I've never... And what I came to realize later was they were asking me for a job. And they were trying to figure out, how do I get certified in what you're certified? And I'm like, you just do it, right? But a lot of times we get insecure and we, we, we think, man, I've got to be something over here. I've got to have this over here. And listen, for some things, you do have to have certifications. But if there's a lot of things you don't have to have certifications for. You just need to do them. And if you're waiting around for somebody to go, you are certified, like the scarecrow in uh, Wizard of Oz. Hey, you now have a brain. Oh, and he starts spouting off things. And the wizard didn't do anything. It was all smoke and mirrors. But psychologically, he's like, I've got a brain now. And he starts, E equals MC squared, like all this stuff. A lot of times, you just, you just have, you just, you're so insecure about yourself that you don't realize you've already got what God's put in you to, to do what you need to do. And if you're trying to be something you're not, it's not going to work. I talk to young guys all the time that are trying to get into ministry, and they latch on to a preacher, and they try and preach exactly like the preacher. We went to this one church, and the preacher had a very distinct way of talking. And everybody on his staff would talk like him, literally, like, identically. He would be like, now, church, I want to welcome you this morning. I'm so glad you're here. And literally, it was like a bunch of clones, every one of them. And I get trying to be like the person you admire, and there's some element of, of like, trying to copy them, but you've got to be who you are. You can't be, and I used to do that. I used to be like, oh, man, I want to be like you know, Joel Osteen or something, like, you know, Mr. Smiley. I'm not Mr. Smiley. I can't do it. I got to lean into who I am. And if you're trying to be something you're not, you're never going to win the battle. So there's this guy named Marcus Buckingham, and he points something out here that's super powerful. Now, I want to explain this, and I want you to listen to me really closely, okay? This could change the way you see everything. And if you like this, go get his book. Now, go, now use your strengths. Marcus Buckingham. He says this. He says, if you're a four in one area and a seven in another area. For example, me, I would say I'm maybe a four if I'm lucky in administrative stuff, okay? And I started out being a seven in communication. Now, what we do, what school usually teaches, I heard about a guy that his son came back from with his uh, report card, and he had five Ds and a C. And the dad looked at it, and he goes, son, 
you are spending way too much time on one subject. That's a joke. Anyways. <laughs> Oftentimes what we do is we spend all of our energy focusing on our weakness, trying to fix our weakness. Now, listen, school is about getting a well-rounded education, ideally. But it, there comes to a point where when you've got some basic knowledge, spending time working on an area that you're just not naturally good at is not going to improve you. And so he's saying, if you're a four in one area, you might be able to take it to a seven. But if you're a seven in another area, you have the potential to take it to a nine. So I've had churches that have been like, hey, come work at our church, be an executive pastor. And I'm like, I could do that, but the best I'd ever be is a seven because I am a horrible administrator. Like I said, keeping things going, not my cup of tea. Now, if you need me to start something, I'll do it, man. And I'm getting better and better as I go at starting stuff. But if you spend all of your energy doing, trying to improve something that you're never going to be good at and wasting that time that you could be spending it getting better at what you're actually already gifted at, you're perpetually going to be tired and you're going to be frustrated. If you're not a confrontational person, but you're trying to become confrontational, you need to learn a little bit of the skills of it, but don't spend all your time trying to figure out how to get things done by being confrontational when you're not. Figure out how to do it in the gifting God has given you. Now, when I talk about weaknesses, let me make something really clear. I'm not talking about sin. If you've got a weakness in an area that's sin, you need to get away from that. Okay? I'm talking about areas that just aren't a natural skill and gifting for you. I'm just never going to be Mr. Hospitable like my wife is. So I can try and be it, but I'm going to come off looking like a guy that's wearing armor that doesn't fit him. And everybody's going to be like, dude, that guy's weird. Like, but when I'm me, people don't like me at first, but eventually they come around. It just is what it is, you know? So some of us, we spend all this time because school teaches us, focus on your weakness, focus on your weakness. You're like, no, man, what you need to do is you need to lean into where you're already strong. And this is what you do. Your greatest opportunity will be in leaning into your strengths and neutralizing your weaknesses. The thing God's called you to do, the thing he's naturally gifted you to do, if you'll lean into that rather than spending all your time saying, oh, if I could just be something I'm not, you're going to waste all your energy. You're going to be perpetually frustrated. What you do is you bring people around you that have the gift you don't have. You lean into what you're good at and let them lean into what they're good at. And you can't be everything. I'll give a simple example in our marriage, in Emily and I's marriage. Emily does not like cooking that much. If she felt like the good housewife would have to be the one that cooks a meal every night, she'd just be angry and frustrated, and so would I. I love cooking, so I'll cook. We're like, well, shouldn't the woman be cooking all the meals? No, if you don't like doing it and you're not good at it, well, she's good at it, actually, but she just doesn't like doing it. She's really great at baking. I'm horrible at baking. Then lean into that and figure that out in your marriage. You say, well, I should be managing all the finances. Yeah, but you suck at handling money. Let your spouse do it. You don't have to be the man that handles the money or the woman that feels it. If you're not good at the money, like hand it over to, some, to, the, to the, your spouse. And that's one of the gifts that God brings us our spouse for. They're usually totally opposite of us. The gifts they've got are totally opposite. And so they can supplement for our weakness. I think about Natalie. I always joke with Natalie, Pastor Natalie here. She loves getting in what I call the weeds. She loves details. She just likes details, man. Like, and I could care less about details. I just like to start stuff. Like, get the boat on the water, and we'll let the details people figure out how to make sure it stays on the water. But, but the details people, like my buddy, he, the guy that started that cafe, that was going to charge that cafe, he was an ex outstanding details guy. But he got so hung up in the details, he couldn't get the boat on the water. I got the boat on the water, and I wish he would have stuck around because he could have kept that thing going and really kept it solid. But that's one of the challenges is, is, is if you think you're going to be everything, you're not going to be able to accomplish all God has for you, and you're just going to be doing stuff that you could find somebody around you that could do a way better job at it and let them walk in their gifting and you walk in your gifting. Does that make sense? Yes. So David, he takes what he's got in his hand already. He takes the staff. He takes his slingshot. He's already been prepared. He's like, I can't be something I'm not. I'm going out there with my slingshot and my staff. And when the Philistines looked and saw David, he disdained him. For he was, he was a youth and ruddy and handsome in appearance. 
And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? Like, what? who do you think you are? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. And here's what David says. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of the God of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you've defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and I will cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistine this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that you said I was going to go to. That'll be you. <laughs> that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with a sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. So then the Philistine rose and came and drew near to David and David ran. He's like, all right, it's go time. This is the moment I've been prepared for, right now. And he ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag. He took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone, stone sank oof, into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground. Now, this is my third and final point. You use your gifts. You use your abilities. You run to the battle with what you already have, but ultimately it's God who's going to give the victory. Amen. You trust God to empower your effort. You use your strengths to the best of your ability. And the crazy thing is oftentimes he'll ask you to do stuff that you, that you seem incapable of. The problem's just too big. But if you'll lean into what he's already given you in that relationship with your son, don't be something you're not. Figure out what you already are and lean into that in that relationship at work. And, and, and this is a really important thing. This is super important. Only you can tell those around you where you bring the greatest value. At work, a lot of times people will shove you into a job or a role over here or something, and you're like, oh, I could do that, especially if they offer you more pay. And I've talked to so many guys that this is the, it's, there's this thing called the Peter Principle where it says we get elevated to our most area of incompetence. And oftentimes a great teacher, somebody will be like, you're such a great teacher. Let's put you in administration. And it offers a pay raise, but it takes you out of your gifting. And so they go become an administrator, and they're a mediocre administrator, but man, they were a great teacher. Yeah. But it's because of a promise of pay or something that they go like, oh, I'll go over here. And then they end up never really feeling like they're fulfilled. But when they found their niche and stayed teaching, man, they, things happened. And God provided for them. And a lot of you are like, I got a weird gift. I don't know how I can make money for it, from it. Well, listen, do what you can to provide for your family. But if you'll lean into that gift in some way, it's amazing how God will come and provide for you through the gift he's already given you. And it's ultimately him who's going to make it happen anyway. Whenever Jesus left the earth, he left the, apostle, uh, the, the disciples in charge of spreading the good, the good news. And these guys, most of them, about three-fourths of them were pretty uneducated fellas. They were fishermen. They were manual labor, manual labor guys, blue-collar workers. But at one point, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they started speaking and declaring truths that were just so profound. And all the Pharisees, all the trained, educated people looked at them, and they were like, well, they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated. They were common men. They were astonished. And they said, what's the common denominator here? And they recognized these guys, these uneducated common men, had been with Jesus. They leaned into who they were and who God made them to be. And they said, I'm his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for the good works he has for me right now. And I've got what it takes, even if I don't feel like I got what it takes. So I'm going to be what he's called me to be. I'm going to work on what I'm strong at. And I'm going to find people to bring around me who are weak where I'm not strong. And we all rise together. And we become all God has for us. You guys receive that? Can you imagine what it would be like if you started to recognize? And this is, one, this is super important. You may have to ask people around you what you're really good at it because you don't even see it. You're too close to do it. You're just too close to it. You may have to ask somebody, say, hey, what am I really good at? And they know, everybody knows what you're really good at. Because they already see it, but you probably don't see it. 
And when you learn what that is, you figure out how you can improve. You can take your seven and take it to a 10. And that area where you're a four over here and you know you're a four and everybody around you knows you're a four, find somebody around you to supplement, to, to, to neutralize that weakness for you and we rise together. Can you imagine what it'd be like to walk in your strengths to where like every day you're waking up going, I get to do what I love doing. That's the way I feel about what I'm doing. I just can't believe God allows me to get up here and talk to people. It's amazing. So I keep working on it. I keep trying to hone my craft and I watch videos of myself and make myself cringe watching myself. <laughs> but I see where I make mistakes and words I repeat over and over again and I'm constantly trying to improve. And you're gonna need to do the same thing in the gift God's given you. Don't just lean on your natural talent, improve it. Become all you can be and then let God take that and take you to the next level to accomplish the purposes he has for you because you're not here by accident. We need what you've got. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much that you have given each of us gifts, skills, abilities, talents. We thank you, Lord, that we get to walk in that. It's a very humbling thing to walk in the gift that you've given us. So I pray, Lord, this morning that maybe we've been belittling the gift you put in us. Maybe we've been saying, oh, this is nothing. And yet God is saying, it's exactly what I need for the battle that I've put in front of you. So I pray, Lord, that we would begin to discover that, begin to discover what we're called to do, and I pray we would push ourselves to become all we can be through your spirit living in us that empowers us to be who you made us to be. If you're here this morning and you have not given your life to Jesus, I'm gonna give you a chance to do that. This is the foundation for this whole thing I've been talking about. Achieving your purpose on earth starts by accepting Jesus into your heart. We're gonna say a prayer. If you say this prayer and mean it in your heart, Jesus is gonna come, he's gonna forgive your sins, He's going to set you on a new course. He's going to give you an eternal address in heaven. Let's say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We've got some resources for you on the back table. You can take that. You guys can stand. You are dismissed. Have a great week. Go walk in your strength. If you are ever in the Seguin area, Come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.